Welcome to MEP's special coverage of President Biden's first trip to the Middle East. I'm Marissa Khurma, Director of the Middle East Program here at the Wilson Center. And today I'll be chatting with Michael Kugelben, a Wilson Center colleague and Director of the Asia Program, to better understand the dynamics of this new quadrilateral forum that includes India, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and the United States. This is also referred to as I2U2. And it's emerged after the meeting of foreign ministers last fall of the four countries um, and met for the first time during Biden's visit to the Middle East. Michael, I'm really looking forward to learning more about the Quad and especially the view from um, South Asia. So economic cooperation is really at the heart of this Quad. Um, there were uh, deals signed uh, worth billions of dollars of investments. Uh, the Indian Prime Minister um, Modi referred to this first meeting as having established a positive agenda. So what is your assessment of the Quad and how do you also see the Abraham Accords contributing to this group forming? So first of all, thanks for, uh, for having me here, uh, Marisa. Great to be here with you. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right that if we wanna look for the major motivations and triggers for this new uh, entity, um, I certainly think that one has to look at the Abraham Accords. These are four countries that get along very well um, but a lot of that goes back quite some time in terms of a growing U.S.-India relationship, a growing India-Israel relationship, a growing U.S.-UAE relationship. But the final, um, the final touch, of course, was the Abraham Accords, which allowed Israel and UAE to have this normalization accord. And I think it's quite clear that the Biden administration has wanted to capitalize on the diplomatic opportunities posed by the Abraham Accords, and particularly in terms of building cross-regional, new cross-regional um, partnerships. And indeed, um, you know, what sets apart this grouping, this quad, if one wants to call it a quad, it has so many different names. What sets it apart from the more well-known Indo-Pacific quad is that it is cross-regional. You know, the Indo-Pacific quad is comprised of, of four countries that generally straddle the Indo-Pacific region. So that makes this quite unique. And I think that for India, um, this, is, this is indeed a very important initiative for several reasons, very briefly. One is that India is always looking for ways to uh, play a, a greater role on the world stage. It's always trying to respond to criticism that it punches below its weight and effect that it, it talks a big game that it wants to be more present on, uh, on the global stage, but doesn't do enough. So this is a great way to address that criticism. Secondly, it allows the US to strengthen its relation, pardon me, it allows India to strengthen its relationship with the US by broadening partnership um, beyond Asia. And finally, you know, we can go into this more, the Middle East is a very critical space for India. Um, India looks to, has looked to the Middle East for quite some time to address a number of key interests and key needs ranging from energy uh, products to infrastructure needs, to arms supplies, to tech support. And so I think that for India, this new arrangement will allow it to uh, uh, move closer to these countries, uh, particularly Israel and the UAE, that are in a position to address those longstanding Indian needs. Um, so uh, you've, you've tackled all the different dimensions, particularly with regards to relationships between India and the other countries. Um, so with this, first meeting that took place, there were um, basically agreements signed for investments. And it's uh, my understanding, or at least according to the news, it's, it's um, primarily in food uh, products. So um, this is very much tackling one of the uh, most urgent needs that um, our global community is facing with food, uh, food insecurity, particularly with the Ukraine war. Um, where do these countries stand and is this their contribution to the impact um, or the implications of the war? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I think that one of the reasons why there had been initially a fair amount of skepticism about this new grouping uh, is that it, th there didn't appear to be any, be any one issue that would bring the countries together. So there was concerns about um, producing substance. There was concerns that these four countries would be able to come out with anything notable on a very substantive level. But indeed, the war in Ukraine has uh, caused significant levels of food insecurity. And indeed, I think that uh, the, four, the four quad countries do see food security as an immediate uh, need. And the messaging before this first leaders meeting that happened earlier this month 
all four uh, uh, I2U2 capitals were, were focusing on this, this issue of food security. And energy or clean energy is another um, focus for sure. And uh, indeed, as you suggest, uh, according to the public messaging, the first initiative announced by this group will focus on food security. The other one does relate to clean energy. And I think it's quite striking that both of these new initiatives will be um, in India. So the four countries will be working together to uh, you know, build the capital and the resources and so on. But there, there's going to be this establishment of these new so-called food parks uh, in, in India, as well as a new clean energy project. The details are still a bit sketchy. But I think that again goes to show how important this new entity is for India. The fact that the two initial uh, initiatives to come out of this group will be based in India. It's very important for New Delhi. So, the, so uh, looking a little bit beyond some of these, uh, these two initiatives and the economic cooper cooperation part of this, what else is sort of bringing these countries together? Is this some sort of group to counter Beijing or is it more uh, that these they got together vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis Iran? I mean, the, 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 it's not quite clear um, what, uh, what this group is sort of meant to uh, counter uh, or, will, or is it if it's able to counter regional um, uh, regional powers um, and if it if it does indeed have a great power dimension as well what what are your thoughts on this yeah I, I think any of those factors could be could be true and it is indeed one of the reasons why we should still be skeptical about the longevity and sustainability of this entity is the fact that there's no unifying cause uh, and that sets it apart is a big difference from the Indo-Pacific Quad because it's very clear, even though this is never stated publicly, that the Indo-Pacific Quad is all about countering China. That is not the case uh, with, with I2U2. My sense is that Washington would like it to make it about that, but I think that'll be very difficult to do. It will be a very hard sell just because uh, you know several or two two of these two of the members of this group, Israel and, and the UAE, um, have pursued significant levels of commercial cooperation with China, and I don't think we're in a position where they would want to scale that back. So it may, it's a much harder sell to make this to try to make this initiative about countering China. But I think that's actually an advantage for it as well. You know, we know that the the Indo-Pacific Quad has become very controversial in some quarters just because it is perceived by critics of the four Indo-Pacific Quad members as an alliance that's posed against China. And we're starting to hear Russian, you know, as Russia's relationship with China grows, we're starting to hear Russia depict the Indo-Pacific Quad in the same way. But you can't do that with the with I2U2 because there really is no clear China dimension to it. But I think Iran is an interesting case um, in that, you know, obviously the US and Israel see Iran as a major rival and the Biden administration's efforts to strengthen or to ease tensions with Iran haven't gone very well. Um, and then if you look at the UAE and, um, and India, a bit different. India's relationship with Iran is very complex. Uh, for quite some time, it had pursued uh, close or close economic relations with Iran because of its dependence on Iranian energy supplies. But in great part because of pressure from the US in recent years, India has actually reduced significantly its uh, energy imports from Iran and it's then turned to Saudi Arabia and a number of its, of its allies, including the UAE, to scale up its energy needs. Um, and so that suggests to me that India's relations with Iran will be difficult to, um, to maintain on a solid level. And then of course, UAE, you would know better than I, I mean, there've been some issues with Iran there, territorial disputes and other things. That's not to say that Iran would become the China of I2U2 in the sense that the four countries would look at Iran as, as, the, as the country against which this group would try to position itself as a counterpoint. But I think that's the one issue that you could look to. If you're looking at some type of cause that the four countries could, could unite around, it would potentially be Iran, but it'll be very difficult to do that uh, still, just because I think you don't have a strong and unifying sentiment against Iran as the Indo-Pacific countries do um, against China. So that's, mm -hmm. that will be, that'll be the challenge moving forward, how to bring more strategic clarity to a group that lacks a unifying cause. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Saudi Arabia, um, Saudi or uh, Indian relations have also been developing. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, first steps towards normalization, even though the messaging from Saudi Arabia 
uh, towards uh, the latest developments, you know, during the Biden trip have sort of tried to temper it a little bit and it's, it's uh, played up a little bit more in Israel, but it's certain that the Biden administration is working towards some sort of step-by-step -step process to also include Saudi Arabia. So do you think that that could be um, an additional member to expand the group um, in looking forward in the future, given also the Saudi-Indian relationship? Yeah, I think there has certainly been speculation about the possibilities of expanding the membership of this I2U2. Of course, that would complicate efforts to name it, right? Um, but I think um, that it's it's probably unlikely. I quite frankly, I think Washington uh, would be a bit hesitant to bring uh, Saudi Arabia into this group, even as it clearly is trying to uh, work more with with the Saudis. That may be a bit too difficult uh, thing to do um, at this point. Um, and you know, with Israel, there's there's that complication. But yeah, India is certainly. Um, it's, I mean, we've seen over the last few years, India has, has increased its relations with a number of key countries in the Middle East. I mean, Israel comes to mind the most. I mean, the India-Israel relationship has come a really long way in recent years. Previously, you'd had a situation where uh, India would try to balance its relations with, uh, with Israel and with the Palestinians, but now it clearly has aligned, not aligned itself, but it is much closer to Israel. Um, Saudi Arabia, for sure, um, if you look at, at so many factors, I mean, the energy uh, cooperation, as well as the issue of the diaspora. I mean, as, as you would know, you, there are many uh, Indian workers in the broader Middle East and uh, almost 10 million Indian workers in the Persian Gulf region alone, uh, and many of them in the in the Arab Gulf, Saudi Arabia hosts uh, a significant number of, of Indian uh, workers, as does the UAE. So yes, there, there are reasons to think that India would want to move closer to Saudi Arabia, but India does not want to give up on its relationship with Iran, for sure, even though it's reduced its energy imports. India has this policy known as strategic autonomy, which essentially means that it wants to have as flexible a foreign policy as possible. It doesn't want to align itself with any one country in a way that it would then not be in a position to have a good relationship with that country's rivals. So that's that's a factor there. And I think that could be a, a constraining factor as we think about the, 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 the hypothetical of Saudi Arabia playing more of a role in this, in this entity. Yeah. And, and um, one last um, question uh, for you, Michael. Uh, what do we look for moving forward? You know, these deals have been announced. Um, I guess governments of the four countries will start operationalizing. Um, but what do we look forward uh, to? Are there um, sort of set meetings that will be taking place? Um, more initiatives to be announced? So I think the key thing to look at is, um, is, is clearly continuity in the sense that will there be um, a desire on the part uh, of the four countries on very high levels to keep meeting? And, you know, that's, that's, and the fact that you had this first leaders meeting is very significant. Um, I think it's notable that the, uh, the Indian uh, foreign ministry issued a statement soon before the meeting in which it said, it revealed us for the first time that there are, quote, Sherpa level meetings taking place between these countries uh, on a regular basis, which means that you have representatives appointed by the heads of state, heads of government to be having discussions. That's key. So that suggests to me that there will be continuity. But yeah, that's that's what we have to look to. Will there continue to be high level meetings? Um, and if they continue, will there continue to be discussions around substantive issues and initiatives such as the two that were announced at the recent leaders meeting? Thank you very much. We look forward to continuing this discussion and perhaps hosting more um, panel discussions um, about this topic as these four countries move closer together um, and start, um, I guess, operationalizing these, particularly these two key initiatives that were announced. So thanks again for your time, Michael, and for sharing your expertise with our audience. Thank you. Great to speak with you.